Amen. Gosh, I've missed you guys. Missed you too, brother. So good to Hope see you. Hope you don't mind. No, good to see you. Good to see you. Looks, ain't they awesome? The whole group. I mean, fantastic. You know, the one thing I remember about pastoring <clears throat> when we was in West Virginia, music was always a struggle for us. It was always trying to get the person to lead and getting the, uh, somebody with the, the talent and stuff, but you guys are so blessed. And, and I know it's under your all's leadership as your anointing has been set abroad over all of these other folks that's in this thing and they come under your anointing and under your leadership and it just brings them to that place where God uses them so greatly. So thank you all so much. And I want to say to Pastor Rob and Pastor Tammy, they are such a blessing in my life. And um, we've stayed connected through this whole time. Me and Rob, every little bit, every few six weeks or so or something like that, we'll reach out. One of us will reach out to one another and just to see how they're doing. And, and I just want to say to all you folks here at Bethel, man, you guys are so blessed to have such a wonderful Amen. pastor and pastor's wife. Amen. And um, so it is, it's a great joy to be with you today. Lord, I can't believe it's been almost two years. This, man, this pandemic stuff is just, I'm over it. How about you all? Amen. Amen. I'm telling you. Over it. It's, um, and I'll have to admit, it hit us. We got caught in the COVID deal here just not too long ago, and um, uh, did we have any effects from it? Really not. I'm surprised. Um, I know that... Um, a lot of folks, I'm sure probably each and every one of you might know somebody that has lost their life um, during COVID. And, um, but God is faithful. You know, about, um, I'm going to say about four months ago, I was at work and I was driving. And one of the things that I do in my job, um, my secular job is, you know, as a hospice chaplain is I spend a lot of time on the road. I travel probably about thousand miles a week. Um, I know that's not a lot when you start talking about truckers and stuff, but in your car and working your job, going from office and out and about, you know, a thousand miles adds up. It's a, it's a lot of miles. So it gives me a lot of time to think. And I was thinking as I was driving along one day and, and, and the Lord just impressed upon my heart, he, he, he began to speak to me about an, an event that I'd had happen in my life. And this has been several years ago. It was probably January of 2014. I had the opportunity uh, to go to Israel. And while I was in Israel, one of the places that we go see, um, we leave Tiberias, that area, and we get on a boat, and we sail the Sea of Galilee, and it comes to port in a city called Capernaum. And if you will you know, look in scriptures, you'll find that that's where Jesus made his home after he grew up and after he left Nazareth. But it was also the home of Peter's mother-in-law and as well as Peter's home. And they got a particular ruin there that they believed to be Peter's house. And I began to think about that. And the city is, it's, you know, when we think of cities, we think of big streets and big buildings and everything. But this city in particular um, was really the streets are narrow. I mean, they are... Narrow streets, you can just barely, I mean, two people walking side by side would fill the street up. And, and so I began to think about that in reference to Peter's house, and I began to think about what it must have been like when Jesus was there that day, and I was reminded of Mark chapter 2. And when, Peter, or when Jesus was there at Peter's home, and, and all the people had gathered, and we know the story of the paralytic who got healed that day. And I began to think about that. And I begin to think, I think, Lord, what is it? Why, why are you impressing this upon my heart? And that's before I knew we was really coming up, before I knew I was going to be with, with Pastor Rob and Pastor Tammy here and be with you guys. I thought, Lord, why, do you, why, why are you impressing upon this upon my heart? And I think about all the people who I talk to every day and every, that I run encounter with and everything because people always ask me to pray for them, you know, and, and let's face it, about 90% of the people I deal with are dying and going to die within the next few weeks or a few months, at mo at, you know, sometimes along. But the one thing that I always pray with those people, no matter what, is I always pray for a miracle from God. 
And I've been blessed to be able to see that. There's nothing gr greater than when our medical director comes in and says, hey, you remember so-and-so? Yep, I got to take them off. We got to put them off service. <laughs> Ain't no greater thing to walk in when the, when the nurse walks in and says, listen, we can't, we're not allowed to take care of you anymore because you're going to live a while, so bye. Amen. Come on. So, you know, that's, that's a pretty great message versus coming in and saying, listen, you're, you need to get your affairs in order. You haven't got long. I've seen people go out of this world kicking and screaming. I mean, literally. Um, but I've also had people laying there and look at me and say, why is he taking so long? Can you imagine the peace that they're experiencing? That they're waiting and saying, God, <laughs> I know I'm an impatient person, but let's listen, this ain't good. Come get me. Let's go. And so you see a broad spectrum. And so I begin to think about this, and I begin to think about miracles because I think about the miracle that that man had that day. And the Lord said, look upon that because that miracle is still available today. Do you believe that today? Do you believe that God's miracles are still available for you today? They're still available for each and every one of us. God is still the miracle working God. He hasn't changed. He's the same as he was, he is, and he will always be. Just as he parted the Red Seas, just as he brought fire down out of the sky, just as he raised the dead, the same God is still seated on the throne today. He hasn't changed one bit. He's a miracle wonder working God, and I believe he's got a miracle for you today. Come on, sir. Come on. Miracles come in such a variety of forms. I believe the greatest miracle of them all is when that person will get up and they come to the revelation that God does love them and that his grace and his mercy is for them and then that they will reach out and they will confess their sin and they will ask God for forgiveness and God will come in and, and they will ask him to be their God and their Savior and he begins to rule and reign in them. I think that's the greatest miracle that has ever been. Come on. Thanks to the finished work of the cross. I find myself when I pray now, I always, that's part of every prayer I ever pray. I say, God, I thank you for the finished work of the cross. Because had it not been for the cross, the blood would not have been shed. Scripture says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for our sins. But I want you to know that God went a step further because three days later, even now. after he died on that cross, even after he shed his blood, three days later there was something amazing took place. There was a tomb and there was nobody in it any longer because the one who was dead was now alive and he's alive forevermore. And he said, because I live, you too shall live. The greatest miracle of all. If you got your Bible with you today, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to Mark chapter 2. And um, I'm going to be sharing the story of Jesus at Peter's house. The story of a miracle. But the thing that I want you to catch today is God gives us a path in this encounter for the miracle that takes place. And because he's the God who hasn't changed, that same path is still available for you and I today. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. And, I, and, you know, and maybe, hey, you might be sitting there today saying, hey, man, my life's good. Everything's going great. I feel good. Life is good. I, you know, I don't need no miracle. But I bet you know someone who does. And the interesting thing about this path is that it has a miracle for others, not based on them, but based on someone else. Have you ever, yeah, yeah, you know, probably one of the most quoted, one of the most misquoted scriptures is when we say this, the Lord will never put on me more than I can bear. Y'all heard people say that all the time? You know that scripture says, actually it says, the Lord will never tempt me beyond the point where that I can bear and that there will be a way out. The Apostle Paul in the book of Acts says that he was under so much pressure and stress that he literally thought about killing himself. Go check it out. I think it's 1 Corinthians, not Acts. He says, I was at the point where I could no longer bear, bear what I was dealing with and it was the point where I despaired of my life. And basically, if we translate that the right way, it says, I wanted to kill myself because he knew he had better things waiting on him. But he says this, he goes, he says, but because of your prayers, 
not his prayers. He got told three times on a prayer, Lord, remove this thorn in my flesh. And on three times, the Lord looked at him and said, nope, nope, and nope. That's my little girl's favorite expression nowadays, no. Pick up that toy, no. You want anything to eat, no. Do you love me, no. <laughs> Thank God she does every now and then say, I love you, brother. <laughs> But in this story, in this account that we're given, I don't want to use the word story. In this account we're given, it's amazing what takes place in a person's life because of what somebody else did. God is never intended on this being a spectator sport. I know that's the way we're groomed nowadays. We like to observe. One of the other jobs that I do, I find myself observing, is I work for the Chattanooga Police Department. And we get to go out and go on ride-alongs and do those things, and, and they're quite a unique characters, police officers are. And I can say that because my brother-in-law just joined the Parkersburg Police Department and back in on the military and stuff. So, um, unique characters. But what they do affects others in a very positive way. So it makes a difference what you do. Come on. I know through, if, one thing that the pandemic has hurt us with is in-person worship. Because honestly, People have discovered that well, I can sit at the house, turn the TV on, and I'm good to go. But honestly, you're not. Because the scripture warns us that as we see the day approaching, what a day, the return of Christ, when we see the, 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 the increase of the ugliness we see in the world today, it says it's even more important for us to gather together collectively. And here's a prime example of what takes place when people come together. See, everybody had gathered. They had found themselves here in Capernaum. And let me just read this real quick, and um, then we'll get into the rest of this. And, and I'm going to try to be very brief and uh, not keep you past dinner anyway. Amen? In, in Mark chapter 2, and I'm going to ask you to stand with me for the reading of God's Word because we revere God's Word. I hope you revere God's Word. Because, you know, see, I'm still weird. I'll set the Bible down, and then if I go to set something else down, I'll start to lay it on top of my Bible, and I get weird about it. And it's like, you know, just throw that on the floor. You know, I, because I really do uphold God's Word. I believe God's Word, and, and, and it's important. Because it is the literally written-down manifestation of the presence of the Lord God Almighty for us to hold and to learn each and every day. In chapter 2, beginning with the first verse, it says, And then he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. He's in the house. Two, there's more than two of us here. It says if there's any two, get, listen, me, Otis, and Ivy got it covered. I don't know about the rest of you. But look, there's three of us. He said, if there's, if there's two or more gathered together in my name, we're here together in the name of the Lord. So he's here. Now, hopefully y'all in the same boat with us. But if you're on the outside looking in, I got news for you. He's here. It was heard that he was in the house. And immediately, immediately something took place. See, that, that's what, when they talked about this morning and Pastor Rob and, and Otis and Ivy were talking about, you know, the desire to be here and to be together, it ought to compel us. It ought to, because we know God's going to be there because we're going to be gathered with other believers, it ought to excite us about coming together. Come on, come on. This, some people think this is a bad idea. But I've said this before. There's sometimes I don't feel like going to church. But then in the back of my mind, they're saying, you know what? Usually something happens good if I don't show up. So I think I'm going to go just to see what happens. Amen? <laughs> so on the days you don't feel like showing up, just show up anyway because something might happen that you might get to see. 
And so immediately, immediately, many gathered together so that there was no room to receive them, not even near the door. And I love this. He preached the word. It's going to be important to remember that. He preached the word. Then they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. Isn't it nice to know that this man had four friends that were willing to carry him? And when he could not come near because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw When Jesus saw, everybody say, saw. What did he see? Scripture says he saw their faith. When Jesus heard about their faith, no, it's not what that says. When they told Jesus about their faith, no, it's not what that says. It says when he saw their faith. When he saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Now that caused a little stir in the house. He saw the guys who tore the man's roof up. He saw their faith. Guys that realized what was inside was more important than who's going to be a... Oh, if they'd only get that message in the church, wouldn't they, brother? If they saw what was inside or what was going on was more important than somebody's roof being torn off, well, I can't believe they're doing that at the church now. I don't know why they have to sing that song at the church now. Come on, come on. There's a lot of things more important than your personal preference. Right. A lot more important than you feeling okay about everything. Because there is the possibility that somebody might know something a little more important than you do. And I ain't saying that to be ugly or mean, but that's just the truth. These four men saw something more important. Knew something was more important than that man's roof. Right. I'm not going to knock anybody down to get in there. What are we going to do? There's a big crowd. Well, I'll tell you what, let's just go rip his roof open. Hmm. <laughs> he might be upset. And you know, one of them had to say this. I don't care. Because we got to get this man in there. Because there's something important in there. Uh -huh. And when Jesus saw their faith, and he brought in, he looked at the man, and he was given the expression we all want to hear. Because if you don't hear what he just said to this man in this life, you will never walk through the gates of glory. He said, your sins are forgiven. Yes, sir. Woo! Yeah, that's right. You can't get in if he doesn't declare over you that your sins have been forgiven. But oh, somebody got upset. You know they did, because it goes on to talk about it. Watch this. And some of the scribes, you know, Captain Pius, he's been to church every Sunday for the last 72 years, served on the deacon board, taught Sunday school. Carries a 62-pound Bible at ease at the age of 93. <laughs> 
draws that scowl look and thinks, dear Lord, what did they do? What are they doing? That tattooed guy that was into drugs and talks about his addiction and what do they think they're doing? Well, they tore the roof off the church. They went down and changed everything in the children's I mean, what in the world? <laughs> and some of the scribes were sitting there reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who does he think he is? We know the scriptures. He said, thy son's sins be forgiven thee. That was my old King James, by the way, if you didn't catch that. Didn't do it in Hebrew. But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit the reason, the reason that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said, why do you reason about these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise and take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And immediately, not four weeks of praying through, not six months of progression, said immediately, he rose up, took up the bed, and went out of the presence of all of them, so that all were amazed and glorifying God, saying, we never saw anything like this. You about ready to see something you ain't ever seen? Let's pray. Father, as we come to you this morning, Lord, we give you glory and honor, and we bless your holy name. Lord, truly I do thank you for the finished work of the cross and the great hope, the eternal hope that you have set within us because of the great sacrifice you made, but going on even further and giving us that empty tomb. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, I know there are those above us, among us today that have the faith just like those four men did. And Lord, we come with an expectant heart. Lord, I know there are those here today who need a miracle. Maybe not even for themselves, but a miracle for someone they know and they love. So, Father, do your thing. Do something amazing and mighty. And, Lord, we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Sorry for making you stand a little longer than normal. But, hey, I've been standing. Otis, he's half standing. There's a three, in this passage, there's three things that take place that I want you to experience today that will lead to the product of a miracle. And the first one, it begins right off the bat, is this. And, and, this, and when I was, honestly, four months ago when I was thinking about this message, I thought this would be the great name of a church. Peter's house. I've never seen one. And then I thought, well, what would be the kind of, the, you know, we always like to throw little subtitles in there. What would be the subtitle? And I thought, this is Peter's house, where the word, faith, and grace come together, resulting in the miraculous. And then I thought, wow, that's a sermon. Because that's the exact three things that take place in here. We're going to begin, number one, with what Jesus was doing that had drew such a crowd. He was declaring the word. Just not any word. And listen, today you can go out here in the world around us today, you can find anybody declaring anything. Some of the most craziest stuff I've ever heard in my life is more prevalent today than at any other time. And I found that if you make the word sweet enough and if you do things, you know, catchy enough, well, you can get a crowd. But is it the Word, the Word of God? 
See, you'll never know the truth unless you learn the truth. And this is truth. It's not palatable in the world that we live in today. With this cancel culture society today that anytime anybody doesn't agree with somebody or somebody says something they think it offends them, first thing you know they're trying to cancel that and put them out and everything else. And listen, it's coming to this. They just ain't got the stomach for the fight yet, but one of these days they're going to try to cancel this book. I don't like all that's in this book at times. I don't know about you, Otis, but sometimes this book upsets me. Makes me feel bad about myself. Come on. And I'd really like to at times just glean on past that. But it's the word. It's not my word. It's not what I created. It's not what I wrote. This is literally the written word of God. You see, God's word appears in two ways. It it appears as the logos, which is the written word, But then what these people were getting was not only the written word, but it was being conveying through the rhema word, which is the spoken word. Jesus was speaking to them about the word. Why did these people gather there? You ever ask questions like that? I ask questions like that all the time to God. I'll read a scripture, read an account, and I'll say, why? I know there's going to be at some point in time when I get to glory, he's going to look at me and say, why? I'll be like, (laughs) just because I've asked why so many times. And yes, why do all these people gather to Jesus? I think number one is this, they had a need. You wouldn't be here today if you didn't feel like you had a need. That, you, you, that there was something, and then, and then the second thing is that there was something to be received. Got a need, and there's something that's going to be there that I can receive. And then honestly, there was just some spectators. The scribes were there for one reason. They wanted to see what was going to go on. And boy, the moment, well, your sins are forgiven. I've seen it. Why is he blaspheming? You got a need today? Let me ask you today. Do you know someone who needs a miracle today? This is the participation part. You can raise your hand on that one. Maybe that hand was for you. Maybe it was for a friend. Maybe it was for a family member. But I guarantee you, somebody has a need today. And you very well could be the one to help them find the answer to that need. They were gathered there to hear the word, but they were also gathered there to see the word. Famous expression, you might be the only Bible someone ever reads. Well, Your good looks ain't what they need. What they need is that visible manifestation of the word in your life. Listen, I've seen people, had a lady just six weeks ago or less, 51 years old, dying of cancer. I walk through the door, very first time I've ever met her, we sit down and we begin to, or I sat down, she was laying in a hospital bed. I sit down beside her and begin to talk. Her husband comes in, very good guy. We sat there and talked, and we begin to talk about salvation, because one thing I will never do, I will never die and leave this world and let the Lord say to me, why did you not at least mention me to that person who was dying? And you run across them every day. 
And so I, I looked at her and I began to share with her and I said, you know, what kind of faith background do you have? And she began to say, well, I was Baptist and everything and, and, and everything. And so when they say that, first thing I do, you know, I go all Baptist mode. So was you a member of the church? Did you get baptized? you been saved? Yeah, that's all they got to tell me, you know. Well, I'm Catholic. Well, have you been through catechism? Have you given your heart to the Lord? You know, have you, have you, have, did you follow communion? Did you follow the, the sacraments? You know, I know how to work down all those paths. I believe that scripture. Paul said, I become all things to all men that by all means I might save some. And you've got to reach them where you're at, they're at. You can't drag them where you're at. That's right. That's right. And so, yeah, and she says, but well, i got this one regret. I said, well, what's that? And she says, I was never baptized. And man, I felt like I was in the book of Acts with the, with the uh, uh, Ethiopian on the road there and where the expression was given. Well, you can be baptized. There's much water here. I said, man, I got a faucet full over here. Oh, yeah, I know it. I did it. I didn't immerse them. Oh, you know. I grabbed that bottle. I said, we'll baptize you right here, right there in that bed. And she says, you can? I said, you better believe it. We got the bottle of water out, and while I was slinging water and telling her, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you, there's a peace that came upon this woman. Tears begin to flow, and a few weeks later, about two and a half weeks later, when she died, I had to do her funeral because I made such a connection over one encounter. Because that's the power of the Word of God. It's, it's, it's not about man's opinion, and it's not about man's set up things or whatever. It's about what the Word of God says. John declared that the Word became flesh. I don't know how Jesus did it, but do you know that everything he ever spoke, he spoke about himself? Because when he declared the Word, he is the Word. He and the Father were one. So whether he was talking about the Father, whether he was talking about a Savior, whether he was talking about the Holy Spirit, he was talking about Him, he was talking about the Word, because there was, for there was anything, there was the Word of God. And the Word became flesh. And that's what we declare unto you today, that Jesus is the Word of God, and it is that Word that will change your life. Here's the foundational question of the day. It's a question we all have to resolve in our heart. Do you believe that Jesus is who he says he is? Everything else hinges on that. Everything hinges on the fact that we believe that Jesus is who he said he is. You know, Paul was down in the jails in the book of Acts. It's recorded. And the Philippian jailer came in and he would look to Paul and, and he would say to him and say, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Go check it out. I think it's the 16th chapter, book of Acts. And Paul simply said this, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the beginning of all miracles whether for you or whether for someone else, whether it is your salvation, whether it is your healing physically, emotionally, mentally. Listen, if there was ever a day and time when folks need mental healing, it's right now after being locked up for the last year and a half and not being able to function and everything. I'm telling you, there's a lot of hurt up here. But the answer is the same as it was 2,000 years ago. His name is Jesus. And that's the word we declare today. It is Jesus who will save your soul. It's Jesus who will heal your body. It's Jesus who will heal your emotions and your psyche. It is only but one way, and his name is Jesus. You see, it's his word that reveals him to us and gives us direction in life. You ever wonder which way to go? Man, I've been there. Man, God's changed my course several times. 
to the point now at the ripe old age of 55, I got a three-year-old. Y'all ever try to keep up with a three-year-old? That's why all this took place. I figured out, you know what, I'm going to do everything I can do to be here to walk her down an aisle one day. Oh, sir. And he better be good enough because by that time I'll be old enough, a life sentence will have no meaning to me. <laughs> come on, come on. See, that's why I got in with the CPD. I'm making enough friends that if you end up there, you'll be okay. <laughs> Psalm 119 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Have you ever asked God this question? Or have you ever made this statement, I should say? Lord, I just don't know what to do. If you ain't ever been there, <laughs> please catch me after service. I want to know how. Lord, I don't know what to do. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. It is a light to my path. His word will give you the direction that you need. You see, that's what all these people were getting. One thing all these people had in common, they needed direction. And he was declaring his word to them that they might have direction. But not only did they need direction, they need a revelation. Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision. That word actually translates where there's no revelation. The people perish, but he that keepeth the law, let me change that, to he that keepeth the word, happy is he. You can be miserable and still be happy. You can still be in dire circumstances and be happy. I watched a lady the last two weeks. She went almost 14 days without anything to eat and anything to drink, laid there perfectly calm in bed, no need of any morphine, no need of any lorazepam, anything to keep her calm and comfortable. She just laid there. And if she would say anything, it would be, was, why is the Lord so late? I ain't ever seen anybody go out like that. And I kept telling the Lord, oh, Lord, if you've got to take me through this process, let me go like that. I ain't never seen no baby. I swear, I don't know that she wasn't already there. I, I, their family asked me one day, why do you think he's hanging on so long? I said, I don't know. I don't, I, all I can tell you is, man, she's at the most peace I've ever seen anybody in my life before they're ready to leave this world. And she was ready to go. I don't know. Maybe she was like Jesus in the wilderness. Maybe she was already there. The body was just, or like John on the Isle of Patmos, maybe she was already there and her body was just trying to figure out what happened. Hey, wait, wait, where, where'd you go? That's what God's word brings to our life. And honestly, it's the very thing we neglect the most. give you a great answer to all the problems in the churches today why people get caught up in bad word. They don't ever read this for themselves. I've always preached and I've always said this. If you can show me in the word where something I say is wrong, I'll be the first one to stand back up and say, listen, I was wrong. Don't hurt my feelings at all to back up. When I'm wrong, I want to make sure that, I, you know, because I want to be right. Don't let just some old preacher you turn on TV just rattle off a bunch of stuff and you think, whoa, that's good stuff. And it all be filled with lies. Line that up with the word and say, hmm, I guess I don't have to turn that channel on any longer. I'll click. Because Lord knows that we'll run out the doors of the church if they change the color of the carpet. <laughs> hey, they might preach bad word, but as long as the carpet's the color I like, I'm good. I'll be right there. Lord, you want to run me off? Just preach bad word. Never change it. Just keep on preaching. I'm gone. That's why I'm here. I know what goes on here. You know, I don't know if y'all, a friend of mine, <clears throat> Dr. Michael Chitwood, and this dude is loaded. And so he tells this story. And um, he was talking about, he was out traveling one time, and he came to this rest area. 
And he said, man, I was kind of hungry. You know, had kind of a munchy attack. And so he went in, and he went in and found a vending machine in the rest area, and he put the money in and hit his button, and nothing happened. And he said, I got to looking, and he said, I see what happened. Didn't get hung up. There was a sign down on there that said, out of order. You're never going to profit from anything that's out of order. See, when you're in a place like this, see, if we live back here, this is where I'd be going to church. Y'all would have to put up with me looking, sitting back here every Sunday. Preach, pastor. Because I understand submitting to authority. It's important in the kingdom of God. I submit my pastor knows where I'm at. I told him before I left. My pastor emeritus knows where I'm at. I told him where I left. Now, I will invite you right now, January of next year, Pastor Emeritus, Pastor Ron, not Pastor Ronnie Jr. Ronnie Jr. is my pastor. Pastor Ron's my apostle. He's having a big conference again, like they've had before in January. And uh, I've been blessed. I get to preach at it. And uh, so there's going to be six or seven of us, and um, it's going to be a heavily prophetic conference. And so I invite you to come join us in January. And listen, I know what the weather's like here in January. Leaves have just fell off the trees down there. It's like early fall in January. I'm telling you. And you can be my guest and come. If you have to have a place to stay, we'll put you up in our basement. We've got a bed and stuff down there. Ain't no problem. We'll feed you whole nine yards. The word. You need revelation. The second thing is, and I'm going to be quicker, is faith. Everybody has been given a measure of faith. Because without that measure of faith, it's impossible to believe the Word of God. So when you're born into this world, God has given you within you a measure of faith that gives you the ability to understand and believe the Word of God that at least you might be saved. Everybody has a measure of faith. But faith is also a gift from the Holy Spirit. So what do we mean? If I've got faith, how can, what does that mean? That means I get bigger faith. It means my faith expounds within me. And I, and I wrote this down the other day. Faith always brings understanding, but it don't always bring answers. Now you got to think about that one for a minute. Faith always brings understanding, but it don't always bring an answer. See, in Hebrews chapter 11, it says, By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which are visible. See, I understand and believe that God created all this. Every, every star, every dust particle, everything God created, he spoke it into existence. My faith leads me to believe that. How'd he do it? I have no idea. I don't have the answer for that. But I have the understanding of how it came. See, these four guys that went up there and began to tear this man's roof off, presumably Peter's house, and listen, think about it. Do you think Peter had a reputation? Come on. He was this really nice, calm guy, wasn't he? His reputation was, man, he's this laid-back fella that everybody loves, and he's just really super nice to everybody, and he doesn't have no issues and stuff and everything, and he's just, man, he's this wonderful guy. I don't think that's quite how the Bible describes Peter. I think Peter's the guy that would cuss you at the drop of the hat. 
I believe he'd be the guy that if you intruded, if you was out, if he was out fishing and you came across and went fishing in his area, you better be ready for the fight. I mean, let's face it, in the garden that night when they took Jesus, he was quick to pull the sword off and whop that guy's ear off. Now, he's outnumbered probably 700 to 1, if not more, and yet he was impulsive enough that, oh, you grab Jesus. And so you know he had a reputation. And yet here's four guys that says, hey, listen, we've got to get in there. Let's just tear the roof off. Do you know whose house this is? Yeah, I know whose house this is. <laughs> really? Are you sure? Yes, I know whose house this is. You know he is going to be mad. Well, yeah. You know he's quick with the sword. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to tear his roof off. Yeah. Because I really don't care what happens to me because it's more important that I get my friend in there because I know the one who's in there will change his life. Listen, you might know somebody that needs a miracle, but they need you to walk up and tell them about Jesus because it'll make a difference in their life. And it might offend them, it might upset them, but you know what? What's more important is who could be in there than who's not in there already. So they go up and they, they put their faith on display. They're saying, listen, I don't care how upset Peter gets. I don't care if he tries to stab me with a sword. I mean, there's a sword. I got to get my friend in there because, let's face it, the only hope he has is Jesus. You know, I hear people make that statement, oh, well, you know, the only hope they have is Jesus. Well, then you better go tell them about Jesus. And so they, they tear the roof off. And of course, I always add stuff, you know me. I, I got to get into people's mind, what they're thinking and everything else. I'm thinking, Jesus, watching them boys tear that roof off. You got to wonder if he asks the question, do they know who Peter is? <laughs> it's a good thing I'm here. <laughs> Peter might not be so apt. To, I don't know, he still might show out. Hmm. Wow. That's some faith. Remember the ruler, the soldier that wanted a, a miracle? And Jesus looked to the disciples and he said this. When he came seeking the miracle, he didn't ask Jesus to come to his house. He just said, you know what, you can just speak it. I'm a man under authority. I know, I know how this authority thing works. I know how this authority thing works. And Jesus marvels at him. I just want one time in my life when the record books are read that there's going to be one instance in my life that the Lord had looked at me and just marveled. Because he looked at the disciples and he said this, not in all of Israel have I seen as great a faith as this right here. And guess what? Someone was raised from the dead. Not because they asked for it, because of what he saw in somebody else in their faith. See, your faith makes all the difference in somebody else's life. Your faith, listen, if you have the faith as the grain of a mustard seed, it says you could tell this mountain be moved and it would be removed, or this tree to get up and go down, and it would be uprooted. If you've got the faith, not only are you going to change your life, but you can change the lives of those around you. It's your faith, not just their faith. These guys came and brought their faith and put it on display. My little girl is, is great. We taught her to pray. And so we'll get ready to eat and say, Eliana, you going to pray for us? Thank you, Jesus, for our food. Amen. You know what? I'm good with that. Because I guarantee you, he's good with that. Now, sometimes we got to slow her down. Thank you, Jesus, for the food. Amen. A little slower. Thank you, Jesus, for the food. Put your hands together, Daddy. 
That's what we get. I'm telling you. It might take 10 minutes to pray through. We'll get there. Food's cold, but we'll get there. That's the faith Jesus marvels at. When you're sitting in the restaurant and you don't care who's around you and you realize everything that you have is because of it. Because we don't owe nothing. It's all his. He just lets, lets us keep 90% of it. When you come to the kingdom mindset that this is not mine, it becomes a lot easier to give away. I want him to look at my life one time and just say, wow, I ain't ever seen so great a faith in all of Israel. Marvel at it. And then look what happens. You see, the scripture says in Hebrews, greatest faith chapter written. If you want to read about faith, read the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. In the eighth verse, it talks about Abraham obeying God because of his faith. Faith will cause you to be obedient. In verse 11, it talks about Sarah receiving strength so that she can have a child in her old age by faith. It says in verse 17, it says, uh, Abraham endured testing by faith. You want strength? It's by faith. If you want obedience, it's by faith. If you want strength during, test, during testing, it's by faith. Moses was protected at birth. Go read that. We know what happened to Moses. His sister took him down to the, to the riverside in a bullbrush ark that his mother had sent her with, and she shipped him across the water so that he would come over to the other side. Pharaoh's uh, sister or daughter found him, and you know the rest of the story of Moses. It says, by faith, he was protected. Y'all ever watch shows with crocodiles in them? So if there's something on the water moving, chances are if they're there, they're going to eat it. Now think about the faith. I've got faith that God's going to protect my child as I put him in this ark and send him across crocodile-infested waters, trusting that when he gets to the other side with the very people who I despise who are killing all these other children, that they're going to protect him and save him. You talk about some faith. He was protected by faith, not his faith, by his mother's and his sister's faith. It says, by faith, walls came down of Jericho. By faith. 11.33 says this, by faith, kingdoms were subdued, righteousness was worked, promises were obtained, the mouths of lions were closed, they escaped the sword, and the weak were made strong. How? By faith. Right. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. And then my faith begins to grow and I begin to live and walk in my faith and the mouths of lions are closed and, and I get strength and I'm able to overcome and I'm to have victory, victory in my life because of faith. And then grace begins to be poured out. In the second part of ver chapter 2, verse 5, and I'm going to wind down with this. I'm going to get you out of here. He said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. That's grace. He didn't ask for it. He didn't even deserve it. Because none of us do. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But it was by the faith of the others around him that Jesus was so moved that he looked at him and said, Your sins are forgiven. You see, it's there in that moment that we find peace of mind. Want peace for the torment that you've been through the last year and a half? Every cold you've ever got, you wonder, huh, have I got it? Or knowing somebody gets it, am I going to die? Are they going to die? Am I going to die? It's the grace of God that gives us peace of mind. To know that I didn't get what I deserve. And I'm getting what I don't deserve. That's what grace does for us. It's the word, it's faith that births grace. And when the three come together, 
Look what takes place. So everybody knows, get up, go to your house. From the man who was lowered in through the ceiling to the man that grabs his bed and walks out the door. Can you imagine all the folks standing on the outside that couldn't hear what was going on on the inside? And they sat there and watched them guys tear that roof open and lower that man down through there thinking, whoo, this is about to get good. There's going to be a ruckus in that house like we ain't ever heard. And then the ruckus breaks out, and they're back there thinking, oh, wow, man, Peter must be stabbing somebody or something must be going on. And all of a sudden, here comes that paralytic guy. Yes, yes. Woo! <laughs> How y'all doing? How y'all doing? Look at me. I don't deserve this. I didn't even ask for it. But God did it. Yeah. That's just like our salvation. Before you ever were. Before you were ever even a thought. God thought of you. For the joy that was set before him, Christ endured the cross. I've preached this before. Heard somebody preach it here just not too long ago. I think, dear Lord, they went back and found one of my old sermons because they stole my stuff. <laughs> I preached this at an Easter, a Good Friday service at Faith Baptist Church in Mason, probably in 1996 or 97. I said, do you know what that joy was that Christ endured? He was able to look across, look across space and time and see every soul that ever was and would ever be and knew that they needed a way out because they weren't going to be able to do it of their own. And he was making a way for them to go back home. The joy that was set before him. What joy was set before him? Being restored to his former glory? He'd care less about that. He died that we might have fellowship and life with him. The word accompanied by faith experiencing grace resulted in the miraculous taking place. Get your bed, go to the house. You ever wonder why Jesus threw him out? He basically that's what he did. He said, pick up your bed and get out. Go home. Did you ever think about that? Didn't ask him to hang around for fellowship time. Nobody extended the right hand of fellowship. He just, he said, you know, take up your bed, go to your house. Get out. Because everybody got to see. Those on the inside, those on the outside. Those in town, those out of town. Family that sat back and said, Lord, he's wasting his time. Here he comes strolling in. What's up? Yep, that's right. I'd be the arrogant, most all. <laughs> It'd be bad. I'd be like, how you like me now? Bed any longer. What you thinking? Hmm? Hmm? Yeah, nothing's going to happen. <laughs> but you can't catch me. Oh, I'd be, it'd be awful. It, it, it'd be bad. Yeah, Lord, I know you know it's true. He's sitting up there going. He is. Ain't no marvel in this. I expected this. I think that's why I feel so young. I think the Lord's decided he's going to have to leave me here for a while because he really don't want to put up with me. <laughs> no, I'm going to leave you there. Keep you there for a while so I don't have to deal with you every day up here. Because I can see it already. Yeah, I made it. Y'all said I wouldn't when I was younger. Boy, when I was wild as a buck doing all that stuff and everything. Y'all said, look at him. He ain't ever going to make it. He'll give up. He'll quit. I made it. <laughs> How you like me now? 
Oh, you didn't make it, did you? I don't want nobody to go there. <laughs> Are you looking for a miracle today? Ain't there a song we sing called Let Faith Arise? I can't remember. I, Let Faith Arise. Let Faith Arise. Am I thinking of a song or am I just imagining this in my mind? Huh? It is Chris Tomlin. Let Faith Arise. Who is it? Chris Tomlin. Let faith arise. Today, whether you need the miracle or you know somebody it does, let faith arise. But make your faith visible. Now, I know we get all embarrassed about up here. And I know you don't have to come here to make things happen. Come on, Pastor Rob. But the scripture says that Jesus saw their faith. He didn't hear about it. He didn't think about it. He saw their faith on display. How many of you know somebody's lost? Raise your hand. Amen. Yes. Let your faith be on display for them today. You know somebody needs a miracle? Let your faith be on display for them today. Tear off the roof. Let faith arise within you. I have gave you the word. I gave you Jesus. That's all you need. That's enough of the word to change the world. Twelve disciples proved that. Minus one, but plus one. They proved that all they needed to do was preach Jesus. And that was more than enough for the word. But then it becomes coupled with faith. And that faith experiences grace. We are here, but by the grace of God. Amen. That's right. You know, we're here today because of the grace of God. Technically, we, you know, we could have technically not been here today because of the old COVID thing. But, but God, and not today. The old devil tried to photo. The devil didn't want somebody here to hear this today. Because it was a little over a week ago we was planning on canceling the trip. But miraculously, all nice, clear little COVID test. Yeah, you're good. I even double checked this morning before I come around people, just to make sure. Because, see, we got our own tests. They give us our own kits and stuff. We're sophisticated in the South. Not really. <laughs> We're not. Clear as a bell. But God, let your faith arise and make it visible, please. You can say, well, you begging them to come to the altar today? Yeah, because that's how we make our faith visible. Yes, it is. Amen. In here, this is the way we do it. And I know it's hard to do because I've been there. I can remember the first time I ever went to the altar. I'd been to Promise Keepers, 1996, Washington, D.C. But got fired up, got filled with the Holy Ghost, what happened? E.V. Hill was preaching. I think I was there. Really? Yeah. Everybody in the stadium stood together and sung Amazing Grace as we went out one night. It was the most amazing thing I ever heard. It was awesome. Like 68,000 men. And Evie Hill preached a message about renewing your mind, and I just got filled up so bad. I thought, Lord, I just got saved. I've been faking it all this time. I really didn't. Got filled with the Holy Ghost. What happened? And when we got back, it used to be every Sunday morning, Pastor Jerry, Scott, would offer the open the invitation. I'm going way back on y'all now. Some of you was there with me. He would always offer the invitation for everybody to come and pray for the service, and there would always be him and Teresa and Sam and Ann McKinney, and their son would be the only ones that would ever go to that altar. I can remember that plain as day. Lord. But when we came back from Promise Keepers that year, 11 of us went. And come time to go to the altar, it was packed. 
all of us went. And from that was a defining awesome. moment in that church, in Faith Baptist Church's life. Because from that moment on, the altars would always fill. From that very moment on. Prayer for the service or even after service. Because it just wasn't a common thing. Make your faith known. Don't try to hide it. We got too many closet Christians today. That's what's partially wrong with what's going on. We need those who are willing to stand in love and declare the truth of God's word. I love you, even though you don't agree with this. And even though it offends you, I love you enough to tell you about it. So today, come get your miracle. And come and receive a miracle for someone else. And if you don't know Christ as your Savior, receive the greatest miracle of all time. Make that profession. You know, the Scripture says, He who professes me before man, I'll profess before my Father which is in heaven. Ooh, I got that covered. I just today alone stood here and professed to you, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I place my faith and my life in Him. Now I've got the assurance of His Word. When I appear there, He will stand up and intercede on my behalf. That's right. Yes. Father, that's one of mine. Good enough. Come on in. I dig it. Oh, Lord, here we go. That's the, that's the confidence. Woo. Death's going to come. We're going to face it, should the Lord tear it. How you going to go out? sure about the process. There's a lot of ways I've discovered over there. That's one bad thing about my job. You can find the good ways to go and you can find the bad ways to go. Sure. Physically. But I don't worry about where I'm going. So did I. Come get your miracle. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory. Praise God. Pastor Greg said, you can receive a miracle today. Come up. He's going to be praying for you. And I'd like to add, if, if there's anyone who would, who's here today that has not received Christ as your Savior, he covered that. Today is the day for you. Accept Jesus as your Lord. Confess him with your mouth. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. Amen. We want to make sure that that's taken care of. Holy. Amen. Praise God. Pastor Greg, you want to just start over here? You want some? Yes. Lay hands. Let me give you some more.